Welcome back, everybody. Um, you've got an embarrassment of riches this afternoon. Uh, first of all, we've got a cinematography masterclass, and then followed by that is editing, two of the most important things uh, that any of you will come across, no matter what you decide your career path is going to hold, it's massively important you both know and understand about these two crafts. But let me just ask a question to start with. Who shoots? Quite a lot of you, so... As you go. Yeah, wow. <laughs> This is your masterclass. This is for you. Um, I d would like you to interrupt me, wave at me, ask questions as you go, because we have two absolute masters of their craft with us. Um, so on my left is uh, Sophie. She is that rarest of people, a wildlife camera woman. She is the person behind the David Attenborough wonderful things that you see on your screen. And then we have Chris Titus King, who uh, does drama and documentary and pretty much everything to amazing standards and across global markets. So they are for you. Squeeze them dry. I'm going to start the job off. We've got <laughs> clips. <laughs> but I do, you know, hey, it's your masterclass, guys, so ask questions as you go. So it's meant to be inspirational. So the first question I want to ask is... What does the job mean to you? Wow, everything, actually. <laughs> it's, um, I think, if you, you do what we do, you have to love it because it's not easy. Um, so it's, um, it's pretty much all-consuming. It's, it's passion. Chris? Um, I think if some people have asked me that before, and if I drop dead tomorrow, I know that I have been from the bottom of the Pacific Ocean 3,000 feet to the top of a volcano in Ethiopia and anywhere in between and had the most amazing experiences and I've been paid to do it and what, what better job is that? That's a good start. Tell me, Chris, how you got into the business. I, I started, uh, I got a job doing two weeks work experience at a uh, company called Samuelson's that were a rental company that rented cameras and had the Panavision license at the time. And uh, after two weeks of fiddling around with cameras and people getting in people's way, no one told me to leave. So three months later, I was still there, still turning up, until someone came down and said, what, what are you doing here? You can't work here. You're not insured. So um, I said, well, what do I do now? And it turned out that someone was leaving in their West End department to running their 16 mil department. And they said, well, I've got a guy here. He's very good. He knows what he's doing. I only had three months' experience. And I went and joined this company in the West End for £75 a week, thank you very much, and, uh, and learned on the job preparing cameras, what we sometimes refer to as kit room monkeys. So, uh, is that bad? Yeah. Anyway, um, <laughs> we, were, we were basically the guys down in the, in the kit room preparing equipment for, for other jobs to, to go out and uh, be used. And uh, I did that for three years, and then decided I wanted to go freelance, and so I was forced to leave by my boss. He said, by ne on April the 17th, you're not working here anymore, so go and do it. And I went out and became a camera assistant, and having made a lot of contacts, preparing kit for people, I knew people to go and see, and slowly but surely found my way in as a camera assistant, and then did that for seven years. And then started to shoot my own stuff, and then uh, the people I was working for, the DOPs I was working for, said, Chris, we're not going to wor work with you anymore, you just got to go and do it, because if you don't, if we don't kick you out, you know, it's not going to happen. And so I went off and uh, started shooting my own work. And again, it, I thought there was a back door. I thought there was a way in that you could slide in through the back door and, and avoid all the whole ladder of, of, of experience. But 16 years later, I found myself getting my first kind of camera experience and, as shooting stuff. And, and then it went on from there. Now you started shooting factual and documentary first. Yes. Did that stand you in good stead? I think it stood me in very good stead because the, the, the trick with documentaries is to shoot fast, um, to, to know how to get the coverage for, um, for, you know, for a, a scene that is... Um, nobody's going to tell you how to do it. You just need to know what the editor's going to need to put that together. And so in documentaries, you have to do that very quickly, and sometimes it's not going to happen again. So you need to just catch it while it's happening. And then when you go into dramas, you can use that skill of speed because the most expensive thing on a film set is time. 
So if you're a slow cameraman, if you decide halfway through a scene that you want to change all the lighting, you're not going to get any more work because people just want you to get it right first time. And so documentaries train you to, to be efficient with your time. And uh, I applied that to drama, and I'm, I've become good at lighting quickly and getting it right first time. And that's about envisaging, seeing it in your head uh, before you start to put the lights on. So we're going to, our first clip is uh, actually a, a fusion between drama and documentary, isn't it? Do you want to tell the audience a little bit about the clip and just set it up and then we'll have a look? So um, in this series, uh, which is a common um, format on TV at the moment, is sort of what they call the docudrama, which are sort of interview-led stories being told by interviewing real people that this really happened to and then reconstructing that, those events. And quite often, the, the uh, interview part of these stories can be quite ploddy and quite sort of, uh, and can detract from the excitement of that scene. And so what we tried to, and I think we succeeded to do in this clip, is, is, to, is to have an exciting um, sequence, action sequence, which cuts back to the real people and, and doesn't interfere with the, with, the, with the tension of the moment. In fact, it enhances it because you think every time you cut back to the interviewer, interviewee, you're thinking, goodness me, that actually happened to real people. And then when you come back to the action, you're, you're left with this feeling of like, goodness, I can't believe this actually happened. And the subject matter? <laughs> the subject matter is two DEA agents go to Colombia to, um, to investigate some drugs issues out there. And uh, through one, put through, as the story progresses, they get kidnapped by the... Uh, by the drug lords, and in this particular scene, they are being taken out in a car to uh, be shot and to be, to be killed. And it's about how they escape, and the rest of the story is about how they get home. And uh, it's, it's, it's shot on a car rig, so what's quite interesting about should this... We see, should we see, see yeah. the clip and then talk about yes. how you shot it? I see the clip, please. Thirty years ago, I was shot in the hip by a drug trafficker. That mission uh, changed my life, and it'll be something that uh, I'll never forget. The impact of the bullet rolls me a little bit to the left. Legs hit the gear shift selector and on the hump, knock the car out of gear. Dorothy hollers at Benitez and he can't get the car in gear. It's total chaos. He's crazy, man. I immediately became concerned about the blood. And uh, I looked down, and my pants were already soaked. The only thing I could do at that time was just apply pressure to where there was the most blood. Duarte gets the car back in gear. We need to get to a hospital. We need to go to a hospital. Suddenly, I see a neon sign. Hospital. Hospital. Is that we just passed it, and uh, that was not good. Where are we going, man? Where are we going? After we got out of Cartagena, then uh, it dawned on me we were not going to be going to any hospital or any police station. It's going to bleed out. We were in deep, deep stuff then. I mean, we were in deep trouble. Pulled off on the side of the road, car stopped, but the engine was still running. Duarte gets out of the car. Benitez gets out of the car. Uh, you okay? They're trying to decide whether they want to shoot us in the car or out of the car. 
I gotta kill us. What? Hey, mm. on the hockey. Mm. I'm listening to all this, and I'm actually staring at the accelerator, thinking if I could just hit that accelerator, that's gonna put some distance between me and the, and the danger. I'm thinking if I was gonna be killed, I wasn't gonna be killed sitting in the back seat of a car. I was, I was gonna make them work for it. I finally am able to get out of the car. And then all of a sudden, I see Benitez. No, 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 no. I just started running. Quite a strong scene, that. <laughs> They did, of course, both survive, as uh, you, you're aware, of it, by the fact that they are being interviewed about their experiences. So, how did you do it, Chris? So, uh, the, the interior shots in the car were shot on a, on a low loader, so the car is, is put on a, on, a, on, a, on a trailer that is um, sort of low to the ground and um, pulled along. And we were shooting this in a dark area of Cape Town with no street lights or anything, so... I rigged lights all over the car rig, all over the loader, that uh, were fed back to a, to a dimmer board on the, on the tow truck so that my gaffer could fade in and out the lights to simulate that we were driving through a street so street lights were going past or car headlights were going past and to give that, that kind of in and out of light feeling that was in the car. Um, and then, of course, when we were in the jungle there, you know, it's very, you know, when you're faced with your first night shoot, you're thinking, I'm in the middle of a jungle. Where is my light source? You know, I've got, uh, fortunately, the moon is full again tonight. How, that's very good. I've got the moon. It's not cloudy. So you put huge sources up in the sky, as big as you can and as soft as you can. And then you've got to think, well, I've got the headlights of the car. That's a light source. So I can, I can f put those at the camera at the beginning of the shot. And there, after that, you, the public, you, the viewer have seen lights. The, the, the t car interior light comes on. There's another light source. And after that, I've sold the fact that there are some lights around. And then I can be a bit more creative when I get inside the car because, because I've, I've created lighting places. And therefore, I can start to light more moldily and more cleverly inside the car. But um, it's very frightening when you're first with your, f your first night shoot. I remember being terrified and thinking, where am I going to put the light? Where, where is it going to come from? And if I'm not in a street situation where there are, there, there are shops or houses or street lights. So um, try, always trying to show where your light source can come from early on in the scene let, gets you off the hook and then you can start to create from there on. So that's the lighting, but where were the cameras? Because obviously there's multiple angles, so you've got we, the car moving, you've got... A... So around the edge of the car has a walkway. So it's a big trailer, and I can walk. And so I shot the whole thing handheld. Basically, I just sat on a little box down the side of the car, and the handheld, I just get all that kind of jittery action. Sometimes I shot with a, with a small DSLR. That I could just chuck in the, in, the, in, the car, in the car and push it around like that. But mainly, we do it over and over again. So we probably sh we spent the whole night shooting that scene. So um, in fact, that was over two days. The car stuff was one night, and then the, the, the scene where they get out is another night. So, yes, it takes a long time. So, you've been creative there. You've got your car on your low, low, low loader and you've got your little trolley and handheld DSLR, which is a very basic camera. Yeah. But yet, everybody kind of thinks drama is big kit. Yeah, well, we had the big cameras as well, but you can't always get a camera into a car and you can't get a sort of jittery handheld shot. And if they're, as long as then the whole thing's not shot on a, on a small camera, then the odd shot every here and there won't be won't be seen. Um, but as much of your job, well, this is a question to both of you about thinking creatively on location of solutions and how you're going to get what you want to get. I think for sure, when you're when you're you, you look at what you have and how you can best tell that story. But I'm, I'm interested to know, I'm like, I'm totally fascinated now by, um, I want to know the lenses you were using. Were you on primes because you've got yeah. so little light? So, yes, I'm, I'm always shooting on primes, um, which are sort of 1.2. 
Um, and I had a, uh, the DSLR I could put the primes onto, mm. so I could still Perfect. get that, that look. So you weren't using kind of stills lenses on the DSLR. Um, uh, but you, know, you, you, you couldn't get any focus control, so it was very kind of, and I, it was gritty. I wanted it to be a little buzzy on the focus and just to, uh, to make, make yeah, you feel absolutely. like you're there. You feel like you're there, you're with the, with the action in the car. But you have to, whenever, whenever you're shooting on a documentary, um, if you're doing recreations, you can anticipate where everybody's going to be. But as you know, with true documentary, you never know where anyone's going to be. Which brings us neatly to your career. Nothing in your working life is controllable. No, nothing. <laughs> really, genuinely. T tell me how you started in the business. I um, met a wildlife film crew when I was 19. Um, I was working in Tanzania and... I, it was sort of a light bulb moment, and I, I, I saw what they were doing. I was like, yeah, I want that job, and um, can I have a job, please? And they said no, which was really disappointing. And um, anyway, I went back to Dublin, and I worked on the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which was as close to wildlife as I could get. <laughs> um, and um, then I um, managed, just through connections, it's all about connections, um, to get an apprenticeship um, or a camp managering for a guy called Hugo van Lauwijk, who's about to become famous again, which is rather lovely, because he's um, he won eight Emmys for his work with Jane Goodall uh, and National Geographic. And there's a new film coming out called Jane, which I'm desperate to see at the end of this month. And it's all his footage shot with Jane and the chimpanzees many moons ago. So I went and worked for him as a camp manager and annoyed him. In Tanzania, this in is, Tanzania. back in Tanzania. Yeah, and annoyed him for about a year until he gave me a camera to use. He gave me a roll of film and said, go on then, go and shoot that roll of film, see how you go. And I'd been doing a bit of sound recording and look, talking to as many camera people as I could who'd been coming through. And I went out, it took me three weeks to um, shoot my first eight minutes of film. And then it had to get sent back to the UK to get developed because it was film. And then we had to sit and wait and then it came out on a VHS and we all sat down in a tent to watch and it was terrifying. And it's excruciating, actually. And um, he looked and he went, yeah, I think you've got, an, you know, I think you've got what it will take. And then he said, right, no more filming. I was like, what? He said, yep, editing room, <coughs> six months, go and do six months, learn how to tell a story before you're allowed to touch a camera again. And then I worked my way up like you, third, fourth, whatever, second camera. So we're about to see your first clip. Mm. Would you like to talk us in? This is the cheetah clip. It's really important that, um, to point out that often in wildlife, it's not just one camera person. There are many of us um, because we all have different sort of skills that you put together. And often there's only one moment, so you can't shoot everything at once. So on this clip, which is the cheetah, yes. um, there was um, an absolutely awesome cameraman called Jamie McPherson, who is, in my opinion, the world's best Cineflex operator. And he was shooting Cineflex, and I was shooting on a Phantom 4K Flex, which is a um, high-speed camera, long lens. Um, and we were both shooting together, so trying to get the same moment. And, yeah. Let's see uh, the clip. Just and, make, do sorry. you a Cineflex to explain what a Cineflex is? A G mm. Cineflex, it's a gyroscopic stabilised um, well no, not wasn't. only on a helicopter they they are used on helicopters but as you'll see on this Jamie rigged it on a car which was the first time really that had been done for this series and um, he developed his own rig let's see the clip and then you can tell us how it was done the final stalk begins. Others block her path. But in a flat out chase, nothing can outrun a cheetah. Two 
lightweight to jump on top, she must trip her prey. Missed. But having timed her run to perfection, she still has energy to try again. Most of that was Jamie's, to be honest. Um, <laughs> but um, the, the, what we wanted to do in that was to show um, the cheetah. We wanted to kind of break down the cheetah's hunts. Everybody's seen cheetahs hunting, but we wanted to really examine the difficulties they face and the prey also, I guess. But um, sort of just to break it down so you can see the kind of skill of a cheetah, the flexibility of its spine. Um, we've got new scientific data about the speed of a cheetah that we wanted to bring in. Um, and the shot, um, the wildebeest calf escaping as she slowly bats um, the calf. You can see everything in her stop. She chooses that she's not going to invest her energy, and that's what the whole filming process was about. Um, so Jamie was in a helicopter with the Cineflex, but then he developed a specialised rig to use from the Land Rover. And, and as I say, we were working together. Um, and the and what else? So, what, where were you positioned? You're on a long lens. Uh, where? How, and, and, and also, talk us through a little bit about, uh, because uh, a lot of it's about instinct and understanding the animals, isn't it? It's um, wildlife filmmaking. I, I've been filming now for 30 years, and one of the reasons you get to film these amazing sequences is because you've done it and you've got to understand the behaviour a bit, um, because it is a matter of, you know, seeing it and watching it. I spent over... 18 months with one family of cheetahs for a film called African Cats and saw many, many kills. And it's, you know, every day you build up that knowledge of, of how to film. And it's a gamble whether you get in the right position or not. You take into account um, everything. We have an amazing team that we work with. I work with a guy called Sami Muneni in Kenya. And Sami and I um, have an incredible understanding um, when we'll, we'll kind of try and work out. It's a wonderful game of chess. Where will the, where do we think the prey is going to be? Where do we, where should we be in relation to the wind, to the landscape, to the, which cheetah it is or which lion it might be because everyone is different. So it's about experience um, as well as then what lens you have, um, the car, the terrain, the weather. There's a lot of things to juggle. Uh, but that wildebeest, I mean, that was lovely. I was really pleased with that. Well, I'm interested in it. We were talking earlier about the storytelling. So was that the same cheetah? Yes, that was Malaika. So that was the same cheetah getting the second wildebeest? Um, yes. So the reason that was in a wide on a phantom, which is kind of unusual. People were like, why did you shoot in it? But we also had to shoot not only for phones um, and television, but we also made an IMAX. Um, so we made large format. So... That, there's a form of that in something called Incredible Predators, which is going out to various things um, by BBC Earth. And um, on the IMAX, that, that big wide is really quite amazing because it's, you, you kind of, so you're kind of trying to think about all the different formats as well as, um, the, actually, no, the cheetah at the beginning, the aerial cheetah is a different cheetah. And it's also interesting about how, when you're working with two cameras like that, how you keep each other out shot. Long lens. Mainly, um, you, um, I was shooting on uh, what was I on a sort of 600, I think most probably, and Jamie would have been on something close to that, if not more. Um, so you, you, your field of view is very slender. So it's, it's really actually keeping all the rest of the cars that are invariably with you out. I mean, there's going to be you know 10 or 15 tourist cars there too. We show you a very clean world. <laughs> so we've talked quite a bit about kit in the first two clips so we've talked about you using prime lenses you use long lenses uh, we've talked about cineflex etc etc mm -hmm. but i want to put a question to you how much is the kit and how much is you so chris first and then sophie uh i think it's it's us more more than the kit the kits of uh, the cameras are boxes that light goes into and nowadays they all shoot 
uh, some sort of log or raw sort of footage, and it can all be made look beautiful later. It's how you control the light that you capture in the most expensive lens that you can afford. Um, so the glass is the most important bit in the camera. The cameras are pretty, you know, it doesn't matter what, who makes them, what electronics they're in. You say that. Yeah, <laughs> apart from the Phantom. <laughs> no, it's the Arri I like. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we all have our favourite cameras, and if we can all shoot on, on Amiras or Alexas, then we'd be laughing, but sometimes the budget doesn't allow that. Yeah. So you, can, you, you need to think wisely where you spend your money. But essentially, it's about what you're capturing I mean, you were talking earlier about everybody's got an iPhone in their pocket or some sort of smartphone. Well, you've all got a square box that you can point at something and capture something, capture a picture or film something. And it's about what you choose to put in that shape that makes you a camera person. It's not about the equipment. I mean, I've, I, I'd, like, I'd like people to go and take an iPhone, do street photography, and just see what shapes and light and, and, and features you can find in your everyday world in the world that is very normal to you and find something new in it just with an iPhone. And then you start to learn about looking and not worrying about the kit. You know, you shouldn't be looking at this bit, playing with buttons. You should be looking out there saying, if I move just here, the light hits off that building and reflects in there. Or the cat, you know, the, the, the cheetah will come into shot just there. That's nothing to do with the cameras, that's to do with your eye. It's, it's about eye, I think. It is about eye. I think it's your composition, and um, I'm a compositional fascist. Yeah. I get really upset if things come in frame wrong. Um, and, I, and I think on that subject, my, a lot of my uh, training that I train myself with is looking at photography, mm. stills photography. For sure. But I've got books and books and books on, on Walker Evans and Irving Penn and all these, you know, Cartier Bresson, all these sort of street photographers who, who looked at the world and saw in prosaic life in front of them uh, shape and, and design and, 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 and uh, capturing, um, you know, what do you call it, a composition. Yeah. Well, it's all about, I mean, documentary is all about natural and available light, isn't it? Mm. Whereas in drama, you can make, and I thought you're, um, the, the cars going past, I was, when I was looking at that, I'm like, that's great. And you must have had to orchestrate that. And that's, you can make it feel. But it's only, only having observed it in real of life. Of course. And then it feels true. And then you're sitting in a car thinking, this is how, this is how, you know, well, you see Hollywood movies and they're lit brilliantly in the front of a car driving along. Well, when have you ever been in a car with a bright light on you like that? Yeah. And that you're having to do that because you've got Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman sitting in the front. They want to see every eyelash on them. <laughs> so you try and light them subtly, you'll be fired. Interesting. So, Interesting. <laughs> have we got any questions at this stage people want to ask before we move on to the next set of this? So uh, one here in the middle and one over there, please. Um, hey. So, um, since you're doing wildlife uh, cinematography, you go to a lot of other uh, go to a lot of countries. So I, I kind of had a question in mind. Um, do you have tour guides that tell you approximately when when the animals come out? Because I'm pretty sure you get like one minute of that footage and then the animal's gone for the rest of the you're, day? You're, it's a great question. Yeah, absolutely. We rely so heavily on local knowledge and people there. We're so lucky because it's not... We get to go and do that wonderful bit of, you know, shooting for, um, you know, a couple of weeks in Kenya or Mongolia or the Antarctic, but actually it's been a team of people who've been working behind the scenes, all the production people, for a year, setting you up and getting the knowledge about when's best to go, who to talk to, all the best people there. So absolutely we rely on, because you don't have enough time to gather that knowledge. So, yeah, for sure. Yeah, thank you. My question was for Christopher, going back to your um, shooting in the car. I sort of wanted the best advice for shooting in either a, sh a moving or non-moving car to sort of imply the movement, because our film, at the minute, we're thinking of green screening the movement, but... Well, there's a, there's a, there's a good question, too. There, there's um, a thing we call the poor man's process, which <laughs> you might become familiar with <laughs> in the budgets that most people have. Um, and it's much easier to shoot at night to, to achieve this. Um, so you can be outside the car, long lens through the windscreen or through the side window. And the, the reason you go long lens is to throw the background out of focus and show the high street is not actually moving. Um, and you literally have people jiggle the car. 
and you literally have the heavy guys from the crew just bouncing on the back of the, of the car, and you just give it a bit, of, and you shoot handheld, and you just you just do that a bit as well. <laughs> and I, I've I've shot a very really successful sequence in a helicopter, poor man's process, on on an airport, under a rain machine with rain going through the windscreen, and literally I'm standing on a ladder in front of the helicopter, just going like this, because <laughs> 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 I've been in so many helicopters that they do that, they go. Like, 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 like. <laughs> And, that's, and I'm constantly in a helicopter trying to stop that happening. So when I was trying to give the movement a helicopter, I thought, well, I know exactly what to do. Amazing. That's great. So that, that's how I do it. And also shoot out. Don't have to be in the car. A lot of people think I've got to be in, in the, site, the seat next to the person driving. So you end up with the camera like this and trying to see the viewfinder. Just get on a box and sit, put the window down and shoot through the window. Then get on a nice 85mm lens, and, and, but be outside the car and just move the camera a bit. Sound, then the sound effect, the, you, know, you put a bit of wind, and then you can, if, you're, if you're doing it at night, you can have lights literally on a stand and just rotate the light. Okay. Just have someone just turn the light around, and it looks like a street light going past. Mm. Simple they thing. They are amazing oh, advice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Great note to self. <laughs> <laughs> let's, um, let's move on. So we're about to see another. That lady there was just. Let you're going to move on anyway. It's fine. Uh, can I come to you afterwards? I'll take, I'll take a couple of questions at once. I promise people will get their say. Um, but it's, we're already half an hour through the session. We've got 45 minutes left. I want you to see the clips to learn from, but I will come back for questions. OK. About to see another clip from Chris. This is a complete antithesis from the first clip we saw. Uh, it's a film about the Impressionist painters. Now, that's quite a challenge, isn't it? Because he, there you are, uh, filming something that is about something that is beautiful. Yeah, so this was with the BBC, and they asked me to do this. And I'd, I'd uh, obviously studied the Impressionist paintings as a, as a kid and loved that, that look and paintings. And so suddenly to get the challenge to, to photograph these painters painting in their environments and give it a feel that it looks like it's part of an Impressionist painting was a real challenge. And so I... Shall we see the clip Just and then you can... See if you see if I got it right or not. <laughs> Let's see the clip, please. Francois Thibault Sisson, from Le Temps. The newspaper? I wrote to you, Monsieur Monet. At least you got my name right. That's a start. I was here on time. I've been right round the garden looking for you. Yeah. Don't look a little red. Huh. Almost vermilion. Journalists. <laughs> they all want to know me now. So many interviews and articles. It wasn't always like that. We saw the world afresh, but for a long time the world didn't seem to understand us. I'm on my own here! <laughs> Studio. My studio. Uh, my studio's out there. Do you always paint outside? <laughs> I invented it. They thought we were mad. Who do you mean by we? <laughs> that crowd. I met Renoir and Basile at Glare's Academy. 
friends I would never lose sight of. <laughs> My father doesn't believe that being an artist is a proper job. So the agreement is that I attend Glare's Academy, or he cuts me off. Well, doesn't your family realise you're going to be world famous? Yeah, we all are, Basil. They want me to take over the family grocery by the sea. You mean you've sacrificed being a grocer? Won't you miss it? I'll miss the sea. You'll miss the vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'd have spent my life in La Havre as a caricaturist if it hadn't been for the sea. <laughs> makes my head spin. And this is what makes my head spin. I don't know if I would have become an artist if God hadn't created the female breast. <laughs> it's, it's a hobby for me. I've, uh, I've yet to sit my medical exam. I'm still painting flowers on porcelain vases. I should have been a tailor like my father. Is that me? My nose isn't half that big. Why? Oh, it's a beautiful nose. Oh, thank you. So you're a laundress? Since I was ten. Oh, such beautiful hands. <laughs> <laughs> so, first question out of curiosity from me. Did you actually film at Giverny in the garden? We or, did. Was it, you'd, or was it uh, recreated? We did film in Giverny. Um, we got permission to shoot in Monet's real garden, so those shots are actually Monet's garden. Um, the studio wasn't his garden, that was another house in France. The, the exterior of the, of the guys walking through the mar sort of market was in, in a small area in Paris, and they walk in the door into Shoreditch. <laughs> so, there's a jigsaw puzzle making those kind of films. You know, er, there's different scenes taking place in all, all over the country and all over the world, um, depending on where you want to shoot it. But you're working with actors here, which is a challenge on top of all the other things you do. Talk a little bit about the teamwork and, 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 and where you're placed in that team. So you're faced with, you've got, you got Julian Glover playing the older Mono there, and he's been in everything from Star Wars to, I don't know, you know, Royal Shakespeare Company, you know, he's a big star and is quite threatening on the, on the set. Um, and there was a point where he walked off because the director wasn't paying him enough attention. Uh, and I had to go, and my role then, I was left in the, everybody was like cockroaches going towards the, uh, the, the sort of, uh, you know, around the corners of the room. And I was left in the middle thinking, well, we've got to carry on. So I went and found him, and, and then you have to placate him. You say, I've got a great idea. Let's come in with some sherry glass. Oh, lovely, Chris. Marvellous idea. <laughs> and uh, and they, a lot of actors like to be pampered. It doesn't matter if they're Tom Cruise or, or somebody who's it's their first job. They're all fundamentally insecure. They, they, they really are. They need to be told what to do. And a lot of directors and production people think that they must know exactly what to do. They've read the script and they know exactly how they're going to perform this scene. That's not the case most of the time. They, uh, they really need to be held and told in the most gentle way, which gives them a chance to, to do their thing as well. So what you mustn't do is, cr is crush them and, and tell them, well, this is exactly how we want you to do it. Because they'll say, no, I'm Julian Glover and I don't look like that. But, also, but to give them, give them time to flower and, and, and give you a performance but give them very clear ideas about where they're going to be put and, and how this shot is working with that shot so they have an understanding of where we're going with that scene, if that makes sense. Sounds a bit like you were taking over from the director there. Well, you're, you know, when you... Well, quite often directors lose, lose the plot. You know, unless they're very famous and well-grounded well directors, they can become very blinded like in the headlights by, by big <laughs> actors. And sometimes it's easier as the DOP... To, to sort of to hold the floor and, 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 and help move the day along because you're, you're not the director. You're, and, they, and the actors love you because you're making them look good. And so they'll trust you sometimes more than they will the director because I think well, the director's going to get me in, to look funny. And, but the cameraman, he, he, you know, he looks at me and goes, oh, I'd like a nice shot like that for you there. <laughs> what sort of prep would you have done for a shoot like that? How uh, you know, the time talk time scales and, and what are you looking at in the prep and, and how you're thinking about the schedule, for example? You have uh, sometimes you'd be lucky to get a, um, two weeks prep on a shoot where you go and that's including having all meetings with the production people. Mm. And then it's you're not a lot, is not it? a lot. And then you'll go and um, you'll do a, a, a recce, you'll look at locations for maybe two days with the director. 
And if you happen to say, I don't like this location, they're going to go, oh, sorry, Quite this is the one you got. Yeah. And then you have a day with the crew, what's called a technical recce, where you, you look at it again. And on that time, you're in your head, madly lighting every room as you go around and talking to your gaffer, saying, we'll, we'll do something up there, we'll have that there. And then on the day, you, you, it, you produce it. I'm always surprised to myself. Sometimes I think, how on earth am I going to light this scene? I have not got a plan in my head. But if I just let myself relax, and, then, and, and it just comes to me. And I always start at the back with lighting. I don't know if you guys... I start with my back lights, and I work my way forward, and I end up with the fill. That way you've molded and you've shaped everybody's faces and heads, and then you just add enough fill to get the correct exposure. It's such an art to light as well. It's such a different thing. And it's, you know, being a, a true DOP, you know how to get everything together. I mean, it makes it, I don't know, you make or break a sequence. Yeah, you're, well, you're, you're lighting. You see, I might have up to 10 lighting people, and then I have another four or five camera people. <laughs> so you're, you're running the lighting department, and you're running the camera department. And so you also have very talented people who look after the camera, and focus pull, and operate sometimes for you. Um, but your, 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 your head is going in different places. And often when I'm looking through the camera, um, not only am I watching the performance, but I'm watching, oh, that light's not right there. So I'm thinking about all sorts of different things around the frame. Um, and so it, 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 you do split your brain into various portions as you're working. So the next clip we're about to see, light played a very important part for you, didn't, didn't it, Sophie? Set it up. I, it did. It's um, shot in Sulawesi, and it's a creature called a tarsia. And they are, they've been shot a lot, but they've been shot in white light. And animals don't like white light because they don't have it at night. It affects their behaviours. And so I fought long and hard. The budget wasn't really good, but I managed to get a IR monochrome red dragon for the shoot. And Just explain IR infrared. Uh, an infrared. Yeah. Um, uh, camera, so um, we gained stops in, we had extra light to play with because we'd gone IR and monochrome and we went off to Sulawesi. I'm just going to say though, my lighting is the first thing I'd ever lit, um, so it's fairly horrendous. But I also wanted quite a foot of film noir harsh look, luckily. Shall we see the clip? <laughs> Some hunters ambush by moonlight. The tarsier, no bigger than a human hand, with the largest eyes of any mammal relative to body size, and huge bat-like ears to pick out a telltale scratch amongst the hubbub. The darkness can't hide an insect from a tarsier. But it can hide a tarsier from an insect. Because tarsiers compete for food, they keep their distance while hunting. Each sweeping its own patch of jungle. But while they hunt, they too are hunted. They have their own night stalker, a reticulated python. It uses scent and heat sensing organs to find its prey in the dark. If the Tarsiers spot it, they know what to do. Call in the troops. All the Tarsiers in the neighborhood abandon their hunts and rally together. Screaming at the python with high-pitched calls.
The game is up, and the snake is driven away. There is safety in numbers, but when the commotion is over, it's back to every tarsier for itself. Can I just say, it doesn't have to have access to be drama. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's great. Th there were so many problems with that because when you decide to work in IR, you're working in the dark completely and you don't know where they're going to go. And we had a 20 minute window, roughly 20 to 30 minute window, where they would come out of their tree every night and we'd be like running around like mad things, trying to get lights, you know, to try and move with them, but also hope that they came into your pool of light. And if you notice, the thing that I wanted was their eyes. You saw their pupils were huge. Um, every other shot, sequence that had been shot to date, their pupils were kind of pinprick-like. They were tiny. And my producer sent me a wonderful email afterwards with a picture of the pinprick um, Tarsia and then a picture of the Shrek cat with those huge pupils um, <laughs> saying, thank you so much for making me use IR because what you showed was that these are really intelligent primates as opposed to... Um, was really chuffed, um, as opposed to, you know, mean, kind of quite evil-looking kind of creatures. So, um, it, and also they got to behave naturally, which is what we want to do. How long did it take you to get that amazing sequence? That was really quick. That was two weeks. <laughs> that was um, every night for two weeks. But that sort of, like, window when they came and went from their, from their little home. Um, but just to be clear, the reason you got those, those eyes, those irises open, is because you didn't put white light on correct. them. Correct. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And because I, I'm, um, I didn't want to influence their behaviour in any way. Mm -hmm. I wanted them just to behave. Mm -hmm. So it, was, um, it was made it much more difficult for us. There was myself and um, an assistant producer out there. The director kind of went out and said, look, get this, get that. <coughs> And then you try and get what you can get, but you never know quite what you're going to get. <laughs> but also, I think you should, you should explain that, that IR, not what IR lights are. I mean, the infrared lights. You mean in terms of well, in terms of you can use them like regular lights, but they, they light up the world in a totally different way. Yes, exactly. It sounds like you should explain them actually. Well, no, no it's just that <laughs> when you turn them on, there's this there's, there's black light. There's yeah, I mean, you know that. So when you put on an IR light, some things they they show up in different colours. So. Um, that's why we use the black and white um, IR because it, 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 everything is revealed. So the snake looks slightly weirdly luminous. That's because you're looking at it in IR um, and it gives you another kind of otherworldly feel. It's sort of slightly spooky, which we were trying to do as well. Homage to horror. So a lot of what you're talking about is, is in effect, it's storytelling, isn't it? Uh, it always. Um, what we have to do, it doesn't matter what camera you have, um, who's doing it, if the story's no good, you're... You're on to a loser. Oh. But what you're doing is you're creating the story yourself. You're sat there in a hide for two weeks thinking, how do I tell the story about this snake mm. coming, yeah. to this, coming to this world? Uh, this exactly. Task. Well, you get one two-shot of a snake, and then you have to build a sequence around it because you can't put a snake in amongst the tarsiers. No. So then you have to create another place where you're with the snake. And we had a snake handler on that because we did have a snake that was from the forest that we... Otherwise, we would have been there but for years. But that's why it's drama, because you're creating, you're bringing the snake in, you're getting the, the, you need the reaction shots. You're, you're doing all the elements that I'm doing in drama, but creating natural history drama. It's the first time I've ever used a captive animal. Every other shoot I've ever done has been with purely all wild polar animals. polar bears in there. Yeah, well, apart from the botane polar bears, obviously, they're really easy to wrangle. Um, but no, I mean, as a rule, I, would, I have only worked with wild animals, so that using a snake and having a snake handler was a very funny and odd thing. Um, um, because it's like you, can, you can't make it go up in a certain place, but you can kind of gently. Mm. But that's the first time, and um, to be honest, it wasn't as much fun. It's much more fun not knowing what's happening. Well, we'll see in your next clip a bit more of that. Uh, I'll take a couple more questions, and you wanted to ask a question, I ignored you before. So down the front here, anybody else? So, and then immediately behind... Um, going back to the 
drama in about Colombia. I'm actually from Colombia, so I was very surprised about this. Uh, where was it filmed exactly? Yeah, we filmed it in quite near Colombia, in Cape Town. Cape Town, <laughs> just there. <laughs> Um, and uh, how long did it take? Like, how long were you there for filming the exactly sequence? Uh, we were there. I was. We were filming for about two weeks in, in Cape Town, so I was there about about a month and all. So with prep time and shooting. So yeah, you would be pretty quick. Mm -hmm, just a month. So uh, did you have to go go back after the first shooting, or that was it? You gotta get it right first time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what about the like um, permission, location permission? Was it? Difficult? Well, you're filming Cape Town, which it has a big history of uh, filmmaking down there. So that all that jungle scene was shot on a on a on a vineyard, one of the beautiful vineyards in Cape Town, and they had a sort of a, a garden, uh, sort of a foresty bit in the back of the vineyard. And I said, I want this to look like Colombian jungle. So I had a, a props department, art department, who brought in palm trees and uh, lianas, and, and, they, and when I came back to the set, I just said, it'd be great to have a more jungle outfit. And they brought it all in. It looked like a jungle. And then they laid smoke that drifted through the whole night, just drifted through the forest with, with a plastic tube all the way around where we were shooting with holes in it. it. Just let the smoke drift through, and it gave that impression of sort of sweaty, sort of, you know, rainforest. Interesting. Uh, and so, hang on. <laughs> I think you've had about four I, questions. There's I, a gentleman in the grey jacket behind. <laughs> Hello, my name is Jacob, and I've got a question. It, the night shoot, it was just one camera? Um, yes, just one camera. And how are you hidden the camera, and how you choose the place? where? where um, the great thing about those tarsiers is that they are um, people, tourists go and see them, and they get great big white lights and they shine them at them um, occasionally, not a lot. So um, we knew the tree. We worked with a guy called Bobby and Bobby knew the tree and he'd been observing them for a month so he knew when what tree they were in because they have different roosts. And so we used, again, local knowledge, expertise. He took us to where we needed to be because you don't have time, you know. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, onwards to a biblical epic. <laughs> Chris, tell us a little bit about this, and then we'll deconstruct the scene yeah. after we've seen the clip. So, um, uh, Mark Burnett, who owns The Voice and The Apprentice and all those sort of things, he decided he wanted to do his own Bible miniseries. So he took $30 million of his own money, and we went yes, and made do. the Bible in Morocco with all Muslim people, which is rather interesting. So th in this scene, um, we, he wanted to sell the, the product abroad, and so we brought in a Korean martial artist to be one of the guardian angels, um, get, let, getting um, escaping from Sodom and Gomorrah. I think that's the story. And I said it'd be great to have this, this, um, these soldier angels to have two swords on the back of their on their back. And I created this fight sequence with this Korean martial artist. And you can see the clip. Okay, let's play the clip.
must get away. The city is being punished. Multiple fight sequences. <laughs> yeah, so the route I chose this clip was to talk about um, filming fight sequences, filming action sequences. Um, everybody's got a wooden sword, obviously, so, um, and nobody's getting hurt. So you've got a combination of... Um, so basically the stunt coordinators and the actors will come up with, with me, will come up with a, with a dance, if you like, which, which involves stabbing, slashing, killing. Um, and you've got to film it from a way that doesn't show that each sword blow is missing, that each stab is not actually making contact. Um, I mean, it's literally like being in your garden as a kid. You stick the sword under your arm and pull it out in a certain way, but filmed in a certain way, it feels real. But then with the sound effect, with the Foley effect of the, the noise, with the, with the blood CGI effects, with um, Hans Zimmer's music going in the background, with, all, these, all these additional things add together to give you the drama. But when you're doing it, it's all in silence. Everybody's just going... <laughs> 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 and and you're, you're running with a handheld and of course you're lighting that whole scene and, and I also want to talk about fire how I lit that scene mainly with fire with real fire wow. because we shot in Morocco where you can just light fires here and I want another fire there and <laughs> can I have some more fire up there yeah no problem Mr King and you just go up there and put a <laughs> fire and so there was fire everywhere and then there's sort of a moonlight for the kind of general kind of exposure but um, yeah, it was great fun doing that but more than great fun, because it's so tightly choreographed, how many cameras did you have on that? Two cameras, yeah. Only two? So main, I, mainly I was shooting handheld, so I was, I was operating a camera as, a, as, you know, as following him down that thing, and then another camera looking back the other way, and then I had a, yeah, so well, we shot it maybe five times, that sequence. Which is not a lot, no. presumably. No, well, we, you haven't got the time to... to to do it over and over and over again. Plus, these guys get exhausted from flinging themselves around. <laughs> because there's a great Moroccan stunt guys who literally will, you'll, you'll point, pull a knife out of them and they'll just jump in the air and flip over and land on the ground. Like, How do they do that? And also, you're painting on a very a huge canvas. I mean, it's all set in, in, in a huge wide shot as well as the individual action. How, yeah, how was so that the wide created? shot with, with Abraham and God talking. Mm -hmm. That's all CGI at the background. They're literally standing in front of a green screen for that shot. Um, and so you take all your measurements and you, you paint all that in afterwards. Um, the, 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 that sort of fireball coming into the ground, that's, again, a real fire on the ground with a CGI strike into it. Um, and you're doing it all, sorry, you're doing it all handheld, which is I shoot not... nearly everything handheld, We yeah. had a discussion earlier about movies and, you know, these rigs, all the, you know, this, the, the lighter weight steady cams that are going on, and we were discussing, you were saying... Well, I, I, I mean, I, you know, with, with movies and steady cams, it's very tempting. They spend, you spend hours setting them up. Someone's fiddling, tuning all these little things, and it's just right. Okay, we're ready with a steady cam, and then you get a shot, and the shot comes in, and you do the shot, and it's great. You've run up the stairs, which you couldn't have done handheld because you would have been like that. So you've got that shot. And now, you, because you're on the steady cam, they think, well, let's just, let's just finish the whole scene off on the steady cam. So the whole scene becomes this sort of floaty shot like that. And you have to remember, say, stop. I don't want the steady cam. The steady cam is just, or the Movi, or the Ronin, or whatever you're using, just use it for the particular shot that you can't get handheld. Otherwise, put that down, give me the other camera. Bosh, on my shoulder, turn over, we've got it. So the right thing for the right job. Just use the... It's a tool. Mm. You mustn't get locked in thinking, this is, this is going to be a great shoot, we're going to shoot the whole thing on a Movi, because the, the operator is going to be dead in, that, in about an hour. Because if you find <coughs> in, a, in, a, in, a, in a little classroom or studio set up where you're holding it, but you hold that in anger while there's a long bit of dialogue going on. I know p p cameramen who've had grips holding their elbows up from underneath, holding them up like that. It's not easy. And it is also, it can be, it can take over things. You'll notice, I don't know, I think there's sort of like fashion for things. So everything now does seem to be drone or movi. And, and sometimes I don't think it's necessary. No. I, I, you know, if it's to drive the story and you need it to do, you know, to, t to illustrate a certain point, then that's fantastic. But you don't have to have a drone shot of something if it's not mm. really telling you anything. The last year I had, they wanted a movi, so I ordered a movi and it didn't take it out of the box. Yeah. And they, they'll go back, and I'll shoot a handheld shot, and they'll think, oh, great movie shot. Yeah, because you have the skills. Uh, we didn't, and we got, we got the day finished, rather than fiddling around for three hours. Yeah. 
when the movie starts going, uh, you're like, oh, I don't know what's wrong with it. <laughs> so you're talking about the hardship on a shoot of grips holding up your arms and long days and all the rest of it, but you've got a particular shoot you want to talk about next. Well, well most shoots are tough, to be honest. You don't do wildlife because it's easy, um, but you, I, I, this was just a shoot. It was, I, it was more that it was sold to me as an absolute. Um, would you like to go to Thailand? Would you like to shoot on tropical beaches, macaques? It'll be lovely. And I came back after three weeks with more lacerations um, on my legs and sandfly bites and mosquito bites. And it, it completely lied. It, but that is the nature of wildlife filmmaking, I guess. It's really, really tough. And this one was pure long lens with a little bit of time lapse. So, again, a well, combination. We, well, let's look at the clip. I have to say that the hardship was worth it. This is my absolute favourite oh, clip. Thanks. So, let's see it. On the coast of Thailand, a most unlikely visitor waits for the tide to ebb. Long-tailed macaques feed mostly on fruit and leaves in the forest. But these have learnt to supplement their vegetarian diet with seafood. As the tide begins to fall, the macaques make their way down to the shore. A beachside restaurant is about to open. There's plenty of food here, if you know how to get at it. The macaques have learned to use heavy rocks as tools to break open the sea snails. It takes a great deal of skill to master this technique, but not everyone has got the hang of it. have to be ingenious to make a living at the coast. As the tide falls still further, it reveals the next course. To feed on this dish, they need a stone tool with a very particular shape. They're after rock oysters. To crack the shells open, they must strike the oyster in just the right place with their chosen tool. The lowest tide reveals a course that is particularly delicious but also very hard to collect. Crabs have good eyesight and can move fast. So catching them requires a special trick. Before pouncing, the macaques wait for a wave to obscure their attack. I have to say that um, Nigel Buck, who edited that, is a genius. Because uh, and Stephen Price, who scored it, um, they made it come alive. It's my favourite sequence too, just because of the way they cut it. 
How much did you think about how it was going to be cut when you were shooting? Good question. A lot. And I think that's always when you're doing wildlife, you have to keep your editor. And when, I mean, all of, any type of filmmaking, you have to keep your editor happy. Otherwise, you're never going to get work again. Um, so, um, yeah, you're thinking about it a lot. And it's, it's not, you know, you're, you're thinking about the behaviours you have to get. And you're given story points, but animals won't follow scripts. They're rubbish at it. So you spend your entire time kind of rejigging and rethinking on a daily basis how you can make a sequence work. Um, and how you can get your point across. But, yeah, that's, um, that's a nice example of amazing editing. Did you know it was going to be edited in a slightly humorous way? I had hoped so, because yeah. I found it deeply funny. Um, that, that male had me in stitches, and that's a problem when you're on a long lens, because it goes straight down the long lens as you're trying not to laugh. Um, yeah, it was a really good moment. And it, it was a tough shoot because we had, we weren't allowed onto the island with them initially because the monkeys, the macaques, would run away. And so it, it was a matter of building up time and patience and optimism going out there every day and getting gently getting closer and closer and closer until we end up getting those fabulous close-ups, which was, you know, the icing on the cake. Had you seen... Before you went on location, do you do prep? Do you go look at archive or no. any of that? You you you. I, you, you, you know yeah. about the behaviour, right. I think. That's a really interesting question, though. You know about the behaviour. I try not to look at stuff because I think it informs you and you want yeah. to go with a fresh eye. And often I was sent to Antarctica last um, Christmas um, to film on a Disney feature and... Um, the reason they sent me was because they wanted someone who'd never been before. So I was sent with a... There was a heap of us who were sent, but I was... You know, they wanted a fresh eye. So just how would you... You know, what would you bring to it? Fresh eye important for you, Chris? Oh, for sure. Um, I think in my documentary career, there was, you know, just walking into a room and, being, and capturing something that's happening in front of you. Is 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 a, is a skill, and as you learn, um, and being not intrusive, but and, but telling a story in your head, I think that's very very key. Is it's not the editors who you're going to talk to later, you know, can only edit what they get given, mm. so they can't create a story out of nothing. So if you're doing the job for helping the the, the job and, and telling the story, even with dramas, you know. It might be scripted, but sometimes a script can, can change. You know, the actor doesn't want to do it like that, or you haven't got time, or you think maybe we can just shoot this whole scene, scene in, a one, in a one wide shot. Um, editors hate you for that. But, yeah. but, um, <laughs> but nevertheless, you know, lear learning to tell stories is, is absolutely key in whatever field you're doing in cinematography. It's the same for you, Sophie. Abs so. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's telling a story and, and also, actually, you know, sometimes not sending them back the shots that they want because you slightly yeah. bullshit and you want to have it your way. Um, yeah. And I think that's great. You put your stamp on it and you have to have the courage to do that because then they'll start to recognise you for the skills that you have. Um, but now things have changed an awful lot because... I'm, I do long lens and high speed, and you, you do everything, but there is, um, certainly in, in our genre, there's an expectation now that you can do drone, movi, time lapse and everything, and I think they're all very different skills. That time lapse was done at a different time to me because the amount of energy and time to do time lapse on tides um, with you know moving rigs is huge, and there wouldn't have been time to have gone and filmed the the macaques at the same time and it took a you know a real skill to do that i did a couple which you know but they're the it's a proper skill but now you have to do everything and i think that's detrimental the other thing we sorry the, yeah. the other thing we were talking about earlier was just um is is not being worried not worrying about um the channels that you, you know you've all got your great film that you want to make and you and people come up to me and say you know you know someone at the bbc surely you can help me get this put on on tv well you've got this huge channel called the internet. You can all broadcast your own films, and, get, and if you're lucky, have three million viewers and get paid to do it. The, 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 you're in a, in a completely different world than when we started, where you, know, you, you spent weeks making a beautiful product, and it was put up against another um, show and completely lost, and it was on at 10 o'clock at night, and that was it. Now you have streaming, you've got YouTube, Mio, or how you say it, Vimeo. And the kit's cheap, too. And the kit, you can, you can shoot on, a, on an iPhone. Yeah, definitely. Um, just, just, you know, it's incredible to, to have that opportunity. 
But does that, this is my final question before we throw it open, um, because it is so ubiquitous and available and you can shoot on a phone, do you think that diminishes your craft? I think it does. I think you have to learn your skills. It doesn't mean that you can, just because you can turn a camera on and, and get an exposure that you're a cameraman. You, know, you can give a typewriter, whatever that expression is, you know, but you yeah. don't get Shakespeare. Um, y yeah, you put the time in. They're, they're, as someone said in the, in the sound um, workshop you were doing, that, that, which I thought was very key, was that there's a huge um, amount of people coming in the business and thinking, I'm just going to be a director. and I'm not going to do any of the training up, up to get to that point. It's vital that you understand all the elements that yeah. make up the film craft. And it is sound, editing, camera, script, music, um, all those different things. And without any, if any one of those, those sort of five or six major items is, is faulty, the, the product falls down. And you so, should want to do it as well, I would imagine. I mean, you should, yeah. I mean there, should, uh, there would be a natural curiosity. I'm always fascinated to sit in and an edit because it's, I learn so much. And, and likewise, when you get a sound recorded out on location, it's, it's, a, it's such a huge skill. And it's, but there's a high speed. Together. There's, but there's a, everybody wants things now in this world. You, yeah. know, you need to invest the time, and you'll really, really reap the benefits if you spend 10 years just working and watching and assisting. And, and, and then you know, you've got a long life ahead of you. Use it wisely at the beginning. Let's put the lights up and take a few more questions. So, yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> OK, so we'll go to the two people in that row. If we can get two mics out there, please. Am I going first? Yeah? Yep. Um, this is probably a question for both of you. Have you ever done a piece of work or a shot that you thought, right, that's perfect, that's what I wanted, and it's just been thrown back or changed or just... Yeah, absolutely. I've, All the time. Have, or just cut to shreds. Yeah. Uh, oh. I've had a sequence that I shot, and it was my favourite sequence, and it just got with the wrong... The producer didn't like the animal that I was filming. And you can tell in the sequence, it's dreadful. And it was a great sequence. I know it was. Myself and the AP loved it, mm. and it was totally trolleyed. So. There's so many committees that, 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 execute, that produce your, your, our staff. So... You've got commissioners, executive producers, producers, directors, all putting their oar in. So very often your, your, your lovely shots are watered down so much that you can't remember what it, what it was about at the beginning. Has there be been like arguments about it and all sorts, or do you just not it's get not, saved? Once, once it's gone to them, we're out of the you, picture. We're, we're employed to do a certain job. If we want to do the big, you know, a different job, like the directing then that's what we'll have to do. It's up to us to make that move and do that as well. Um, we can't sit there and moan. We'll just have to... That's part of what you have to accept. Yeah, 80% of what you shoot on a day might not make it. Oh, really? No, <laughs> I might, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, much more than that for yeah, us. Just it, pass the mic to... Uh, you've got a mic. Yep. Just teasing. Um, yeah, I was just wondering... My question's for Sophie. Uh -huh. And I was just wondering, I can imagine that there's a lot of, like, unpredictable things that happen with the animals when you're filming them. I was wondering if you'd be like any dangerous situations when you... I have a, a, a... This is a really boring answer to a, a <laughs> question. And um, I live in London. That's the answer. <laughs> That's dangerous. People are dangerous in London. Animals are, you know, I would, I would take the Serengeti any day of the week over where I live. <laughs> <laughs> but I have had run-ins. We all have. Um, but I would imagine that you've had as many on sets. So, but it is, I mean, there's a little bit of risk, but really, yeah. people are the most dangerous thing in the world, aren't they? <laughs> Who else? Okay. Here, and then immediately behind. Hi, um, my question's for Sophie. Basically, at the moment, I'm writing my dissertation about wildlife documentary, and I'm looking at sort of like narrative and storytelling. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering, when you sort of create your story, mm. do you, are you with the people who sort of come up with the story at the beginning? Like, are you there at at the start all the way to the end or no absolutely not they um they have these amazing teams that will there'll be a researcher who's brought on to research the story and they have a level of amazingness that i'm stunned by they find stories out of nowhere and then they'll work with the producers and then you'll get either a storyboard or um, a sort of sequence list before you go out you maybe have a couple of phone calls not necessarily even a meeting um but they'll also, because of what we do, you sort of there's a kind of innate understanding that you'll, um, you know what 
they kind of want in a way because it's going to be a behavioral sequence usually it's going to be behavioral and um does that answer that does that make any sense yeah yeah thank you pass the mic just behind you <laughs> hey my question is for christopher um so one of the problems that i have when i'm filming is uh i have to film with light that's already set up and it would be most of the time yellow light and so you have the scene in Morocco where you're having fire as uh, your main source of light, which creates a lot of yellow light. Um, so how do you um, reduce the yellowness and the orange tones in your, um, in your shot, or is this all done through post? Yeah, the graining. Yeah. So you, if you shoot log on your cameras, you, you, you can pretty much ch change all that. You can make make them go blue, green, yellow, whatever you want. So Put your lot on. It's, 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 the grading now is incredible. So, um, yeah. You're Thanks. looking for tones more than colours when you're shooting. Yeah. Last two questions. Okay, gentleman there. And a gentleman here. Uh, hi. Um, I just wanted to ask, obviously, you talked about action sequences, but how do you approach shooting dialogue? Uh... In, in, a, in, for instance, in the Impressionist clip, for instance. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question because you, especially when you've got more than two people, you, you have to get your line right, you know, your, your cutting line. And it's, very, uh, it's, a, it's a, a big thing that people get wrong if they jump the line. I don't know if you're familiar with that, what that means. But um, uh, you, can be, you can be very creative with, 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 with dialogue. You can jump the line. In fact, I have jumped the line in places and, and for... A, to make a point, to, to, to do something that forces the, the viewer to look the odd at it. Um, it's, 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 it's an open question. How, how do you, you know, to film dialogue is, can be quite dull, but you can make it exciting if you, uh, if you do it on the move, on the run. Not everybody's not everybody standing still to do dialogue. You can, um, you can go very wide and post-sync it, um, record the sound separately. There's all, all sorts of... So quite an open question. <laughs> Final question. Hi. Um, my question is, um, when you're uh, shooting like documentary or like a drama, um, how does like the framing of the shot, the composition of the shot affect the story? And how do you, how do you totally. compose that? You, well, that, that's that's what we're talking about. And that's the eye. You know, that's why you're employed. You know, we're employed for specific jobs because you know Sophie finds beautiful compositions within nature. I find I try and find compositions and um, which which reflect the story I'm trying to tell. So um, that's something you can't really learn from a book. You just have to go and experience and look at other people's work and and whoever you enjoy looking at. Try and replicate that, you know. Pla you know plagiarism, why not? <coughs> uh, use other people's work. Just you know, I think I think that's what we do. You know, I think we take lots of other people's work, mix it all together, and that's your work. Yeah. Because you know, you 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 can't reinvent the wheel every time you put a camera on somebody. You know, but you just find yourself being influenced by all the all the all the paintings, the photographs, the films. You just got to absorb as much of it as you can, and it becomes your own style through an assimilation of all the other people's work. It's also it's interesting. I'm I'm left eyed. Um, if I get something in my eye, which happens quite a lot, weirdly, when you're outside filming stuff, I sometimes have to frame with my right eye, and I frame totally differently with my right eye, and really not as nicely. And it really upsets me when I watch the rushes afterwards. So um, I had a camera assistant once in Alaska, and he had been photographing with his right eye because he was right-handed. And we did that sort of stupid thing where you line up a light and you kind of look through one eye, and it, you know if it moves that thing. Um, I'm sure we've all done it. I'm not going to. But anyway, um, he was left-eyed, and after that, he started selling his photographs, and he makes thousands. So go figure. It was just he was using his wrong eye. <laughs> It's true. I swear <laughs> to God, it's true. There you go. Yeah. I think, sadly, we're out of time, even though we could go on for ages. So I'd like to say a big thank you, Sophie Darlington. <laughs> for Lovely to meet you.